record and we'll all right hey james it's courtney here from brisbane stoics james is in sunny where are you sunny england somewhere Yeah, yeah, sunny Winchester, Hampshire, south. and and the picture in your background is that is that like your neighboring countryside Yeah, that's just a, a hill kind of like around the back of town. Yeah. oh nice Yeah, i favor Athens. this one this is from porridge Oh, yeah, so it is. So it is, I've only just noticed. Yeah, <laughs> cool. so james runs this very popular um stoic a, sto a website on stoicism called living living stoicism but you recently Yep. changed it to zenonian that Yep. might be a good place to start we were just discussing um um what we thought about as you put it james very finally very well um about um commentators on stoicism pre-digesting it for the audience and how that has given you your particular um project would you say in stoicism anyway you Yeah, start well, you start where you you like and give us an idea what you're doing and and uh and why people are so interested in it because they seem to be really interested in it well, yeah, it's um to, to pick up what we were just talking about. There's a lot of modern commentators that have found their own way to stoicism and um, have come to their own conclusions and then have started presenting their own conclusions as to what stoicism is about. as what stoicism is about when in fact they've they filtered it very heavily and they've tainted it deeply with their own with their own views and their own priorities um and their own prejudices um and that has what has been presented as stoicism whereas the ancient philosophy is a lot bigger and a lot deeper and um i think as we were just discussing, people should be allowed to do that kind of like making sense and filtering process for themselves without it having been kind of done for them in advance. They don't need to be told before they approach the subject that some aspect of the philosophy is not relevant um, or is, is ridiculous or, um, or whatever. People should be able to look at that warts and all and Mm. work Yeah. that out for themselves. Or in particular, that some kind of cardinal feature of the philosophy is to be read this way when it when when it's not that obvious that it's supposed to be read that way in the first place. Well, no, there's um, the popularizers, naming no names for the moment, um, have quite a light connection with the experts. Uh, the situation is that There are a lot of experts in academia that know an awful lot about Stoicism. But um, that is very inaccessible and very piecemeal. Um, you know, somebody doing a PhD will like focus on some tiny little corner of Stoicism. Um, and the so that, you know, the, the general public don't really have access to that. And it's a lot of hard work. On the other hand, you have the, the popular commentators giving very broad general views of what they think Stoicism is about, but with very light contact with the experts. Mm. Um, and what I'm trying to do is try and create a bridge between um, what can be made accessible to the, to the general public, um, informed by the text directly and informed by the experts. Um, and then, you know, and, and do that, as I say, warts and all. Um, so even if some aspect of it might seem ridiculous to person A, person B might find that fascinating. So they get to see all of it. Yeah, that's a good point. Because you do present it that way. It's like, well, this is the material and this is what it says. Um, and you have, and I, I like how you put it often, you sort of say, you can you can call yourself a stoic if you want, or you can call yourself the Pope if you want, you know, Mm. but this is, it's up to you to make sense of it. And, uh, and but sometimes people get quite heated in, well, a lot of people get quite um, heated and agitated when, I feel like they think they're being called out, but actually you're just being rigorous about um, the material. Well, I, I'm a one-trick pony. I, I, I will tell you to the best of my ability what the Stoics thought. 
um and you know on what they believed and and the background to it and 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 how that cashed out um without telling you that you you have to believe it mm. you can I, I can tell you something that the stoics thought and it's up to you to decide whether that makes sense to you or not or whether you want to go and explore it further um but in in insisting on giving an explanation of all of it there are people who've identified themselves as stoics mm -hmm. um and they find themselves kind of in contradiction with what the stoics actually said and that somehow calls their identity into question yeah and then it all starts getting personal um well it's not about that you know i don't i don't care it sounds it's not callous you know it's not my business what what yeah, somebody yeah. wants to identify as but if um if somebody believes x and the stoics believe y and they still want to call themselves a stoic so be it but the stoics still believed what they believed it's um why do you think the experts kind of don't step in and sort of well because they are involved in modern stoicism as an organization for example how come they're not a little bit more vocal about well this is a kind of a pop culture reading um this is what it actually says how come someone like yourself for example is playing the role of some sort of mediator and and you'd think the people who are particularly interested in, in finding this stuff out and presenting it to an audience wouldn't play like a bigger role in that regard, if you know what I mean. Um, I think that's complicated. John Sellers, um, who to his credit, you know, is involved in public philosophy, um, has discussed this and he said that, um, you know, fellow experts, fellow philosophers have said to him in private, Kind of, I, you know, I really admire what you're doing, but I would never do that myself because mm. their their job, their role is experts teaching philosophy in an academic environment and stepping outside that to, to basically to mix it in the, in the public sphere is frowned upon professionally. It's kind of, I think it's like a peer pressure thing. No. Um, so they don't. And, um, and on the other hand, kind of like getting into the, the mosh pit of, um, you know, um, debating with people on Facebook or on Reddit, yeah, is quite fraught and and sometimes not very elegant. So okay. you can kind of see why they don't. Mm. Um, but it would be nice if we could have these kind of like these these, these fairy godfather kind of or godmother kind of angels that could kind of like just pop in every once in a while to to settle a dispute but um because it's kind of like a different role really They're like a professor of philosophy and um kind of street philosophy or public philosophy they're not they're not really the same they're not well, really the yeah. same job but i think that's interesting because what we've got is the rise of street philosophy in thanks to the internet probably you know so thanks to these facebook groups you've got ordinary people i'm a tradesman you know and most mm -hmm. of the time so we're just ordinary mm -hmm. people and Ordinary people can pick up philosophy, and I imagine that's very much in the spirit of the Hellenistic philosophies. You know, it is a, it's a therapy for the soul. It's a, it's a philosophy for the everyday Joe and Jane. Mm. So, and yeah. I, I find that really exciting. I think it gives voice to the the ordinary person. So I'm very happy for it. Um, mm. um, how do you feel about that? And I guess does that fit into the Zenonian project or? Living stars, um, well, yeah. What I what I'm what I've seen because I've been kind of around since about two thousand and seventeen, um, and at the time, popular stoicism was um, was dominated by a very small group of the popularizers, who are all still around, um, speaking to. A bunch of people who who'd never really heard of stoicism before so the the popularizers kind of like were the experts um and we were all kind of like listening to them and kind of like hanging on their word and what what's now happened um over the last what seven years now um is that you're getting kind of the general public members of the public being more educated and looking into the philosophy more deeply than the original popularizers 
mm. and having a deeper uh, understanding and then and then questioning the um you know the the, the pop stoic interpretations so um if that continues which will be kind of like a slow burn as it were mm. um you know we're actually going to see an evolution of like a greater expertise a, a, a maturing of the conversation mm. and um and a deeper engagement mm, that's because great. um the, the thing my thing is is that i come at, at this from like a, a philosophical background not mm -hmm. from a psychotherapeutic background or not from a um not from a self-help background so mm -hmm. i actually find um you know that the the deep philosophy very interesting you know like how does mm -hmm. this relate to physics how does this relate to justice you know the, the legal system you know free will determinism you know all the big questions in philosophy mm -hmm. um and um that aspect of stoicism has not really been revived in mm. in serious philosophy as well so it's on the one hand it's kind of public facing um on the other, on the other hand it should be kind of like facing back to the experts mm. as well and kind of like making them uh, look at the philosophy more seriously because and... it rivaled it why it eclipsed it, aristotle mm. and aristotle is still wallpaper in modern philosophy Mm -hmm. and the stoics eclipse them and they're just kind of like not there mm -hmm. so it's um it's a very different way of looking at the world and i think it's i think it's worth worth knowing about basically definitely i guess the zenonian page that you run is a a, a forum where people are trying to like you say revive these views of um physics and and mm -hmm. these deeper questions in in that are relevant in modern life today. I guess, mm -hmm. you know, you said you come from a philosophical background. Um, I, I come from that psychotherapeutic background. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that's what's wonderful about stoicism is some of, I guess the people who get into it, get into a rabbit hole with it, for example, have a, have a pet project, you know, like for mm -hmm. me, oh, I wonder what the stoics would have thought about human psychology. You know, that's mm -hmm. really interesting to me. And I think it completely meshes with, um, your interest in physics, for example. And I think that's exactly what's interesting about Stoicism is you can start at one end of the spectrum or one particular topic and come out somewhere somewhere mm. else. And there's this cohesion, this kind of harmony between... Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's all one one system. Mm. I mean, the, the psychology is part of the, the physics. Yes. Because physics is a, like a, a bad way of translating it because... Um, for us, it means kind of, you know, like the, the mechanics of big things. Yes, we mean um, nature. But for the Stoics, phusis was, 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 meant nature. So it was the science of, of, of living things mm. and how living things, um, well, come to be and pass and, um, and how they interact and how they understand themselves. So it, the whole... Um, psychology is is fascinating it's um it's kind of a leak an ecological psychology if you know jj mm. gibson i don't um, know gibson but i've been following some of the stuff you post you you got me quite interested in an activism i've been following long and the four mm. yep and and I, that's great too because uh i've always been looking for an alternative to kind of the 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 popular Cartesian views, and that took me a long time to get my head around, you know, dipping mm. in and out of the phenomenologists and that. But but that uh, and activism and, and it's given me this idea of uh, Stoicism as a way of seeing nature or, or human beings in nature as deeply embedded in the, in the mm. lived worlds and that language is just a technology that we use that connects us, you know, deeply embeds us through our systems with one another I think, and that's the wonderful thing about Stoicism is uh, if you get, it seems if you get really deeply into it, it, it reveals, it reveals the world as it ought ought to be seen, and then it takes away the kind of uh, film that we have over our eyes. Do you, do you, do you find that like a bit of a personal revelation for you? I'm constantly astonished as to how modern a lot of it is because. Um, giving a bit of history they the, the the greeks saw humans as as animals um that that kind of like grew from the earth 
kind of mm. like we're just kind of complex plants as as you know as far as they were concerned um the stoics in particular um and that changed with christianity and that changed with the enlightenment and we kind of came became special and separate mm. um and human minds became something unique that were not of nature and could not be explained naturally. Um, and then Darwin came along and said, you know, basically we're, we've evolved cheese mold really. Um, and that has kind of like put us straight back into nature. So we've got a hook kind of like post Darwin straight back into the, um, into the pre-Christian era. Mm. Um, and they, were like astonishingly clever people you know with eyes and brains and they could see how the world was operating and they came up with some amazing insights yeah and i'm just constantly astonished as to how modern it is mm. if you look at um hierocles um who's a bit later than marcus i think he's he's the guy who does all the stuff on oikiosis and the circles of um uh concern he also does um stuff on animal perception mm. and um you know like how do birds know they have wings and you know how, mm. the, how the bulls know they have horns and, and what they are for yeah so like humans or animals in in the same sense we have hands you know like yeah. what are they for yeah um uh, we have a we have language what is that for and how do we know it and it's it's, it's basically bringing us back down to earth um where we're not kind of disembodied minds mm -hmm. looking at the world through a through a kind of like a veil of perception we're mm -hmm. kind of like with the inactivism we're actually part of the world and mixed in with it yeah um and fully participating in it is the 19th century thing of like the stranger alone in a society of strangers mm. um and which is existentialism and everything and the stoics just throw that all away and yeah. you know we're back in as, as 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 rational social animals yeah in a natural world so it's a very refreshing way of looking at things yeah and you can see how um i think anyway that the language of providence kind of fits well with an activism or this kind of we're in the world kind of view because you think if we're deeply embedded in the world then the world is kind of given to us in a certain kind of way, you know. So it it reveals itself, and 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 through our use of it, we reveal ourselves and all that sort of stuff. That fits also. Yeah. That's very natural, but also kind of is a natural way of talking about a providential picture, you know, because the world is given to us. It has very. I, I like to see it that way. Well, it's. I mean, it's lovely. There's there's two quotes. I won't be able to pull them out off the top of my head. One is by uh, Panatius. And um, or Cicero quoting Penatius, and the other one's by Daniel Dennett, and they say the same thing that kind of like nature slash evolution, kind of like we we came from it, and it gives us mm. everything we need. And there's this idea that is common to both. It's um of fittingness, mm -hmm. of, of adaptation. You know, kind of like we have um you know we have a top set of teeth and a bottom set of teeth. Yeah. Um, uh, it's um and. Uh, it took you know the world is organized such that you know these th these things like yeah. teeth and eyes and hands and and, and other people and uh you know they're fit together mm -hmm. that we get um you know like food comes out of the ground i mean <laughs> wow yeah you know like what, what's that about it's um and uh we kind of like developed over millennia to be able to take advantage of that so it's kind of it's, there's an optimism to it. That, yeah. you know, it's not all it's not all roses, but kind of um we have a place in the world. Without having to have a magical kind of benign father sitting on a cloud somewhere, we, we can find it in the world all the time with us. Yeah, checking you're not fiddling with yourself under the blankets. It's um <laughs> it's um no, the, the this example from Plato is um that the Stoics use is the idea of um the world as a well ordered house. Mm-hmm. That you're, you know, like we have this space where everything we need is basically available to yeah. us, and it gives a if really. If only we could know how to use it properly. Yes. So that is the benevolence of of providence is that you know we have been provided for. 
Yeah, that's beautiful. And I was going to ask you about that. Uh, obviously, the Stoics see themselves as the proper followers of Socrates. And I think, I think in the Zenonian group, you do get a sense of that where it seems you're, 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 fairly um close to sticking to a socratic direction at least in the way that you you treat people it has has that feeling about it and and it raises a kind of dialectic and i think dialectic produces a kind of community so it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier on about the amateur voice you know the street philosophy and all that it seems so, the socratic approach i was going to say gives gives um a place, a platform for street philosophy to happen. And I think, it, would you agree that, that that's kind of part of your project is to, is to follow that kind of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I am, I am kind of accused of being kind of like, a, you know, just a, a historian and a philosopher, and it's not practical, which is um, nothing could be further from the truth. Mm. Um, but the Socratic thing is, if you boil it right down, is why do you think what do you think? Mm. You know, what are your what are your reasons for for thinking it? Um, and mm. is it you know, is it, it is it on target? You know, are are, are you deluding yourself? Um, are yeah. you and I've are noticed you, are you fooling yourself? Are you lying to yourself? Um and, and like self knowledge thing. And like Socrates, they and I mean, I'm not trying to put you on the spot by making these sort of comparisons, but but he doesn't let people get off the hook too easily. And generally in polite discourse, we tend to let people off the hook with some sort of throwaway line, like, oh, well, you know, it's just what I think. Oh, okay, yeah, fair enough. Okay, we'll have a good cup of tea, you know. But instead, you kind of go the next, you know, the next step and say, well, why do you think that? Why do you think that? Why do you think that? And I've noticed you'll actually stick with somebody and and try and educate them. So, and and obviously that to me looks. Well, it, it, it's, it's to educate them, but there's also an awareness that um the people are watching. Mm. Um, so if somebody is saying something and it will usually be something that is kind of historically inaccurate about the stoics um is if it's inaccurate i you know, i don't really want to let that pass mm -hmm. because i want people to know and this is kind of a mission you know i'm i want to present stoicism as honestly and as completely as i can and if somebody's kind of cutting corners and saying oh well it's something else i'm going to say well that's not you know that's not justifiable and you know that's um that's not what we're about we're not about i was gonna say it's not about people pleasing you don't want to upset everybody yeah but the project is is education and if somebody doesn't want to listen to you um you know i'm just i'm going to carry on saying the same thing yeah you know, fair enough um, yeah well maybe that could be the name of the book honest stoicism huh oh i've got about six names for it um <laughs> I can't remember what the latest one is. Uh, Are you going to bring I've, out a book? That would be interesting. It's harder than you think, actually, because I'm actually trying to like cover everything. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a big book. Wait, no. Well, I, well, that's the other thing. I want to keep it down. You know, uh, like it, it's not going to be. You don't want to frighten people. You know, so it's going to be. You know, like a regular sized book. <laughs> um, but it's it's going to have to pretty much cover everything because. The, there is still no textbook for Stoicism. Mm -hmm. If somebody says, I want to learn about Stoicism, recommend me a book. There isn't one. I believe the Dummies Guide just released one. <laughs> that is... Um, that's... I mean, it's kind of flawed. It's kind of like pre-digested. Um, I'm sure it is. <laughs> and, um, and kind of... Un uncharitable as well um you know they will say well you know like clearly this aspect is rubbish mm. and um you say well a you shouldn't really be passing that judgment and and it actually makes a lot of sense if you look at it from another direction mm -hmm. um and what people haven't grasped which is my current thing is um that it's a completely different way of seeing things um that we are not familiar with. Mm -hmm.
so people like the guys who wrote the dummies guide they have their traditional cookie cut um plato aristotle aquinas kant hume um philosophy education And it, 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 stoicism is bluntly odd to them, so they they just kind of like waving their hands and say, "Well, this doesn't make sense." Yeah. And I say, "Well, if you know, if you came at it, if you engaged with the Stoics more seriously, mm -hmm. and instead of engaging with Kant, you engaged with Spinoza, or you know, instead of engaging with Hume, you engaged with Thomas Reed, and all these other kind of like philosophers in parallel traditions, um, it makes a lot of sense." Mm -hmm. Um. But it's a process philosophy, yeah. Um, which is keeping it simple, which is, you know, like it's, it's a very different way of understanding things. It's not the same as atoms. It's not the same as substances. It's not the same as yeah. um, kind of like laws of nature. It's, it, it, it's something else. And there's an interview with um, Tony Long on Massimo Piliucci when he just said, oh, I just realized it's a process philosophy. Oh, there and you go. You're going, yeah, yes, 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 it is. So yeah. it's a completely different way of seeing the world. Yeah. This whole, you know, this whole idea of like everything flows and everything mingles into everything else. Yeah. Things arise and then sink back in. And there's not really any kind of like really kind of discrete fixed objects in the world that everything kind of like comes out of everything else. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of sounds like hippie stuff on the one hand, but it also sounds a lot like science new science on the other it's um well i agree i was reading carl rogers who was that psychotherapist or psychiatrist in the 50s and he 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 kind of came up with these radical notions in psychotherapy of positive unconditional regard for example mm. and being non-judgmental in the therapy space and treating the person as their own expert of their own life And I read his article from 1970-something, and basically it's process philosophy. That's how he gets mm -hmm. to his um, how to treat people kindly. It comes out of this consciousness as actualizing and that the universe has a kind of uh, form formative tendency where smaller things gather into bigger things and eventually mm -hmm. consciousness arises. And it just shows you how practical that can be because he revolutionized the the space from, you know, something that used to be so expert driven, the psychoanalytic, um, um, you know, what do you call it, couch, into treating people with this um, rational dignity and rational respect. And that's what I, you know, I love about mm. this is it crosses barriers. You can be talking about quantum theory or whatever. You could be talking about the four E's of, of the new science of the mind, for example. Or you can be talking about... 1950s psycho psychotherapy and its um, movements away from psychoanalysis and you find process philosophy in the background yeah william james is somebody i don't know mm. that much about but his name's just cropped up as a um as a as a as a process thinker mm. um so that's a new channel to to look into um so you know as you understand more kind of like it opens up more doors and more avenues Yeah, and then you can go back to the Stoics and kind of understand things kind of differently agree. again. But, and um, yeah. I think William James famously read, um, well, he talks about his reading of of the Meditations, for example, because he dealt with depression for a big chunk mm. of his life, and uh, and I think the interesting thing about James is that it leads to well, you know, his final position is pragmatism. And I think that's kind of a middle way for a lot of people who do stoicism. They kind of end up with this point of like, well, it may or may not be true, but maybe the truth is not the most important thing, but rather the quality of life it gives me. That's very much a kind of William James takes a kind of view. Like, at least that's how his view is popularized nowadays, pragmatism. Yeah, I was thinking of falling down a rabbit hole on that. It's... um. Yeah, I can see how you can get from process philosophy to pragmatism mm. because everything is kind of, um, well, it's like virtue ethics. Everything is relational. That's mm -hmm. the, the process thing. Um, that's the causality thing. So you don't, um, so you can't have 
kind of like fixed rules and, and fixed laws of you know like you must do this and you or you must do that or you mustn't do this because everything everything depends um and all you've got to do is um make the best sense of what is going on to the best of your ability which is the whole socratic thing you know mm. is, is kind of like making sense of stuff yeah um and acting in the most um appropriate way yeah. to the best of your understanding which sounds like you know like silly common sense but it's actually quite that's profound. I yeah, it's, it's actually quite radical, you know. It is. I I to be honest, I got knocked off my feet reading that Euthydemus. I I stuck with it for like 6 months or a year. Keep I kept going over it because of that that idea of doing well and the ambiguity of doing well and that suddenly the ambiguity sat, saturated everything that Socrates was talking about because he starts all these conversations with like you know, what does everyone want? And they say, we want to be happy. And he's like, yeah, to do well, right? To do well. And mm. and and people are, yeah, to do well. We want to do well. well what, is, what is doing well? Because you think about it, it's so ambiguous. Is doing well getting a, a nice car and a house in the countryside? Or is doing well making proper use of our functions? You know, it's really, yeah. that's a very deep question. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, the whole thing of, um, it's the whole uh, thing, like virtue is, um, is the proper use of things. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the core of it, right? And that's yeah, where you refer to it as... Yeah, that's the whole idea of It's, um, you know, fittingness. You, yes. You're doing what is fitting, you know, doing the, um, the right stuff yeah. with the right things. Um, Which takes us right back to our process stuff again. Well, it's Heraclitus. Um, you know, he um, he has these um, he has all these paradoxes that aren't paradoxes. Mm. In fact, he's uh, you know things like salt water is good for fish and bad for humans. <laughs> um, you know, so is yeah. is salt water good or bad? Well, it's both. You know, yeah. and neither. It and depends. It depends on what you're doing with it, and it's like um, it's like you could take a plant, or you could you could kill somebody with it, or you could cure their disease with it it's um is it a good plant or a bad plant it depends on what you're trying to do with it and this kind yes. of whole socratic notion of an expertise mm -hmm. of knowing what to do for what reasons is mm. um is what it's all about you know kind of like are you are and you doing it? The, the socratic thing is everybody seeks the good yes um but almost nobody is sure about what that is absolutely but we can't act without some notion of the good in the background that's that's that uh, our understanding constitutes our movements and our emotions in the world and that well that that's that's um epictetus is big on this and this is back to mm. hierocles and back to the animals is that um all living organisms at a very base level are programmed to go towards stuff that is beneficial and to move away from stuff yes. that is harmful. Um, and that comes as base. Um, and we're born like that, but that has no content to it. Mm. Yes. It doesn't tell us that, um, you know, like putting your hand in a fire is bad. You no. kind of like have to stick your hand in the fire and then go, ah, that's, that's a bad thing. Um, that's um, right. And that's what another thing that really struck me when it, one of those things that the more you sit with it, the more profound it is. But the more obvious it is, too, is it's in Diogenes Laertius, the idea of that nature has made us conducive towards our own constitution. So it's just such a profound idea. Like, oh, yeah, of course, you know, but like you say, it doesn't have content. It's just that we're made that way to know that we should pursue things that are going to help us to do well back into that Socratic thing again, you know? It's, and it's very modern. It's very, very modern. I was thinking of Daniel Dennett, um, may he rest in peace, um, said um, what the first law of evolution was don't eat yourself. Yeah. <laughs> it's That's kind of right. like, and it's, it's the whole thing, you know, like the first, the first impulse of all animals is, 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 is the integrity yeah. of himself. Yeah. Um, so which is like basically avo avoiding damage yeah um and then kind of like maintaining yourself um, and this is hierocles again and that kind of extends from yourself 
yeah. you know, to your parents, um, you know, to your children, to your neighbours, to your friends. So, you know, this this blurring of the barriers between care of self mm -hmm. as, as, as a priority and how that transforms into into care of others. Yeah. It reminds me, who's the guy's name? Um, um, Holberg. Holberg's mm. Developmental um, Theories of Morality. Oh, Kohlberg. Uh, I don't know Kohlberg. Yeah, Kohlberg, yeah. Yeah. It's um, you know, you you start off where you know, like you you pull your sister's hair, and then your mother tells you off, so you don't pull your mother's hair because your mother tells you not to, and then you understand that you shouldn't because it hurts Sarah, and then as you get yeah. older, you understand that you shouldn't do it because if somebody did it to you, it would hurt you. Yeah, and then you get to the whole thing, you know, as you get older, so like, well, just hurting people is wrong. Yeah. Um. Um. So that the eukaryosis is this kind of like developmental mm. understanding of, of of ethics. I see um, it even uh, it kind of runs deeper than that because if you totally um, are committed to this idea of choosing the good for yourself, you know, because you know nature has just made us that way to move towards beneficial things. Well, this is where I get interested in it as a psychotherapist is. Well, what does that mean about the kind of person who falls into a state with themselves where they see themselves as doing wrong or not doing well in life? And and that's, to me, what I see every day when you talk to people who are struggling in their lives. They they have this inner voice that's saying things to them like, you're a piece of shit, you know, you, you, de you, de you don't deserve anything good. That's so counter to this kind of natural instinct that that apparently we've been raised with. So I find that really interesting because there's obviously something in that picture that that's um, that's really wrong. And then when people, when you really nail people with this question and say, um, "Don't you want to be the hero in the story? Don't you want to be the thing, the 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 good agent in the cosmos? Don't you want to be the one who gets all the good things?" And they and everyone will say, "Absolutely, absolutely, more than anything in the world." So that instinct is there, but it's frustrated, and that's what interests me about stoicism is that stoicism. Funnily enough, I was looking at that, to that today because um, it's something I haven't really looked at, uh, into. Because they um, the whole thing is from the Euthydemus that. Um, is that knowledge is the only good, um, which is this expertise of knowing what to do and, um, and when to do it and why. Um, and conversely, like ignorance is is the only vice. And mm -hmm. um, as you say, we've got this inbuilt capacity of, you know, like seeking the good. And, 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 and it is an act, you know, kind of a constant drive for us to kind of like work out what is a benefit to ourselves. Um, and and how that goes wrong, and where that goes wrong, and um, the short answer is that it's learnt. Mm. It's um, we have this optimistic natural capacity of kind of like of um, of caring for ourselves and seeking the good for ourselves in the best possible way in the world, and that goes awry because we we're taught kind of like false values. Yeah. Um, or we we we're taught, um, or we may we we come to understand uh, kind of untrue things about ourselves, and we untrue things about other people, and untrue things about our place in the world. Um, yeah, that's right. And that's when it's the intellectualism. It's that's when people's thinking um, kind of gets caught in um, a dysfunctional spiral, as it were. Absolutely. Because they start thinking that they that they're worthless when they're not because they've been convinced of it yeah and you're right it is a spiral it reinforces it we build on that on that false knowledge on the errors the capacity to make error gets stronger yeah because you know you, you start coming up with conf confirmation bias if, if your parent tells you you're stupid and then your teacher tells you you're stupid and then you, yeah. you go out into the world looking for evidence that you're stupid and you find it exactly it's um so you know you look like you find what you're looking for it's yeah. um so there's a, there's a lot at stake, really, um, talking about stoicism, because like you say, you know, you want to present something to people um, that's pre-digested or, you know, not digested for them by some expert. Same thing. I'd like to go back and um, think about what psychology's missed, you know, because psychology has only been around for about 200 years, whereas stoicism had about 500 years at least uh, to think mm. through these very interesting questions. 
And um, I think they got a lot further with it. And I think psychology today has made some wrong turns. So I think psychology would benefit from from a rethinking. Well, going back to um to Aristotle, it's um psychology today is still sits on Aristotelian assumptions. The whole separation between you know like appetite and reason, mm. um you know emotion and reason. You you see all these um these self help books like the, the like the chimp paradox and you know the um the mm. rider and the elephant and um all these kind of like dualistic. kind of like mind body splits that you know like kind of you have a separate animal self the reptilian brain um Mm. Uh, yeah and um it, and it, that is kind of rife and the um and it the turned stoics out, is christopher gill is very good on this yeah and He's, it turned um, out that carl sagan invented the tripartite brain or whatever as it's used he nowadays. popularized it popularized it he, yeah. yeah no there's a guy called mclean who invented it and then sagan mentioned it Or, or or discussed it in a book. Um, yes, discussed it in a book. Um, uh, yeah, and I was just thinking it was Carl Sagan's wife was the guy that um, the the, girl, the woman that invented uh, came up with Gaia theory. Oh, really? Yeah, that's a bit of a tangent though. Hmm. Um, and I forgot where I was. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> I'm trying to wrap it up. So I'm thinking, All like, right. what can you say about you know, in the context of what we've just spoken about? What about the Brisbane Stoics? They they want to get they wanted to do a deep dive into Stoicism. Why should they join the Zenonian group? And um, what you know what would be good about that for them? Um, well, because it's it, it, it's access to the it's like freebase <laughs> freebasing <laughs> Stoicism. It's um it's the um yeah it's getting kind of like access to the the pure stuff i mean I, i i present it as honestly as i can but i'm you know i was somebody you know like born in the 20th century you know like yeah, i'm yeah. not an ancient greek so i can't explain it as well as you know if you had chrysippus speaking fluent english sitting in front of you it's um i so i so i have my in my own biases and lenses but um it's 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 kind of like it's it's the pure stuff and it's all of it And even if I don't, I mean, I, I don't often get to discuss what I actually think. Because ba what I'm presenting is what other people thought yeah, as best I can. And I might actually think something at the back of my mind going, mm, I'm not really convinced by that. Mm. But I'm not going to say, don't to anybody, don't bother looking into that because I'm not convinced by it. Because mm. I might have misunderstood it and somebody else may look into it and follow it up yeah, and find out it makes more sense than I ever did. So, um Yeah, well, so I, it's, it's um, I'm accused of gatekeeping. It's the opposite. I said that once, but I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> I meant. Oh, I didn't have that in mind. Actually, I didn't have that yeah. in mind. What I meant was, though, when I do say those sorts of things, is um, it's really good that there are people here willing to stand in the way of, um, say, like you said, experts who have made up their mind that this is the way it should be, and they and they're quite um. powerful they have a powerful rhetoric at hand and they've got marketing on their side and they can push their agenda and i i've always thought some people have to stand in the way of that if if there's you know something that needs protecting then then so be it you know well i mean i thought when i discovered stoicism i thought okay there's going to be loads of stuff out there You know, there's going to be lots of kind of like really clever, th uh, clever people who've written a lot of stuff, accessible stuff mm. that people can plug into. And I kind of like looked around and you go like, well, this is all, you know, stuff made up, and, you know, like improvised, um, um, thought through by people who haven't really engaged with the subject. And um, and if you look out there now, it's it's better. It's better now. Yeah. But it's still, it's still early days. It's sure, still early days. I think the the amateur street philosopher audience, or whatever we want to call it, they've done a really good job. And you know, people like yourself, kind of uh, manning the helm, have done a really good job. Like you stand up to those guys that no one would dare stand up to, really, basically. So, and that's 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 really. I think that's a really important task. And you know. I'm reminded, I, 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 when I first came across Stoicism, I think I read a paper by John Sellers on Roman 
stoic mindfulness and how it's not mm -hmm. meditation basically and i was really struck by that because my background in psychology was in critical psych and there's this influence from foucault who talks about discourses of power and he was talking about how psychiatry or the psi complex is this really powerful discourse and it makes its way into ordinary life and it kind of subsumes our common sense understandings of ourselves mm -hmm. and i and I, when i saw stoicism being used by some educators to do um, psychological techniques for example straight away i said look there you go that's the side discourse that's psychology infiltrating this new hobby new interest this new new thing that has appeared in the world you know stoicism as a kind mm. of modern movement and and i said to myself give it 10 years, give it 15 years, they'll do to it what they did to mindfulness. They'll rip the guts out of it and they'll present it as a bag of tricks that you can use um, to present to a, a client and it'll be completely stripped back of anything meaningful. It'll just be a technique. And so I thought, and this is why I keep saying it's good that there are gatekeepers. We need to prevent that from happening. We need to prevent them from... Um, devouring it and and regurgitating yeah. what they the skeleton of it you know I, th I think um a few years ago there was a, there was a there was a fight for the label stoicism you know is everybody standing up saying you know i'm the new stoic i'm the new stoic i'm the new stoic and everybody kind of like trying to claim an identity and i think there might have been a window when it might have been possible to kind of like draw an outline of to what a, a new stoicism might have been, but that was that was lost. That 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 opportunity was lost, and now kind of anybody with a YouTube account is is a stoic. Yeah, it's um the um if you look at Stoic Week um and Tim LeBon and the his stoic exercises and he says oh you know come and join us and you can do stoicism oh, yeah, yeah. for a week uh you know like a couple of years ago I'd be jumping up and up and down saying but that's not stoicism but that's not stoicism and now I'm kind of like okay you know like yeah, um, you know, like the horse has bolted. You know, like the milk is being spilled. Yeah, you can have it, that. You can call yourself. Stoic. But it was always going to. That's kind of the point, too. Yeah. But we yeah, need but to. We can keep, I need... like the term slow burn. I just came up with it. If we can keep the kind of like the interest. Yes. In the in the in the in in the basics in 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 the Greeks and in the Romans, if we can keep that burning. Yes. Um. You know, that's um. You know, like it's a deep seam to be mined. Yeah, and you're I right. Think if um if like um stoicism as psychological exercises is going to go the way of mindfulness it's going to run out of steam because it has no depth it's just going to and it's just going to be incorporated as you suggest into you know just a host of other techniques that um psychotherapists are using kind of yes. pragmatically and they they're not really particularly interested in in where it came from in the same place if, if it works and that's um, why I see the value of what you're doing, because you're saying, no, 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 let's let's not forget the physics. And let's not forget the worldview of the Greeks. Let's let's try to not that we can see it exactly as they saw it. Mm -hmm. but Let's remember process philosophy. Let's look at it's it that way. One of a, um, a, um, the um, Socratic things is um, he's, I think it's the gorgeous where um, he's asked somebody, um, he said, what are you doing? They said, I'm, I'm teaching virtue. And you say, well, what is that? And they can't say. Yeah. Um, and you get a, um, like a lot of the kind of like the pop self-help psychotherapy and everything. You say, what are you, you what, what are you doing? Are you, uh, they, oh, I'm a psychotherapist. But what are you actually doing? Mm. Kind of what is the material of your work? What, it, what is a mind? Mm -hmm. Like, what are you trying to repair? Um, you know, what do you think has gone wrong? And then you get start getting theoretical. Yeah. Um, you get some weird answers too, because I've asked them directly. I've said, you know, stoicism's not CBT. And they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we know that. And I say, well, why do you kind of put them together all the time? And they say, oh, it's just a coincidence. I'm a CBT therapist and I'm interested in stoicism. All right. Are you sure? Because that's not the way it comes across to the audience. Well, I mean, it's it's Ellis, isn't it? I always get the REBT and the uh, CBT guys mixed up. Yeah, it is Ellis. I mean, he 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 was influenced by Stoicism, 
But he was also influenced by Buddhism. He was also influenced by Epicureanism. That's he right. was also in, uh, influenced by Freud. He was also influenced by Rogers. He was also influenced by... He was also Just because the Stoics are in there, alongside Exactly. everybody else, And now doesn't it's a make marketing it Stoicism. catch cry. It's like, oh, guess what, guys? There's a thousand different evidence-based modalities out there, but CBT can draw a, a completely connected lineage all the way back to Socrates. And it's like, no, it can't. It can if you're, if you're the guy who's stretching I did the actually truth have a bit. um a very interesting conversation with Donald Robertson um um about this and what happened with um with logo therapy and how logo therapy kind of like lost its um lost its mantle is that um the ethics of psychotherapy don't allow for normative ethical philosophy. Mm. Yeah. If you look at Epictetus, he's, you know, he's talking to his students and he's calling them wretches. He's calling Yes. them fools. He's telling them that they're wrong. Um, you can't go to a psychotherapist and have him tell you, tell you you're an idiot. It's Well, you can, but it's not <laughs> popular. You won't get many yeah. clients. Yeah, no, but Yeah. you're right, because I'm struggling with the same thing. And I've created a, um, I've started trialing a group therapy version of this. And uh, I just base it around the euthodemus to start. So I say, like, this is the language. They're talking about how can we learn to use our metacognitive capacities better? And that means you're going to do it right, right or you're going to do it wrong. So Part of the what we do is um, talk about how we could do it better and identify the errors in which we're not doing it quite, quite well. And then and that opens up a discourse in which you can actually say, yeah, and and you could do better next time. Right. You know, you, you failed to understand your function. Right. Yeah, 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 I did. I feel, you know, I feel like I need to make more progress. I need to take this seriously. Yeah. The other thing about um, stoicism, thinking about that, is um, it's quite radical. Is um, the externalism is if you go back to the kind of like they're going back to Descartes and everybody else. It's kind of like you know I am a lone lo locked up in my head, kind of like looking out through this veil of perception. And um, the the Stoics, the Greeks, had more this relational idea that Mm-hmm. you know, like kind of like you are not. kind of like a, a mind alone in a skull you are you are a, a father a son a, Yeah. a mother a brother a cousin a neighbor um and uh, you're a language user so Mm. you're talking to people so uh, uh, metacognition is i mean something we all know it's um it's it's ex it's externalizing your own thinking it's externalizing your own thinking to yourself but the way to get to that is just by talking to other people and we do that all the time you know like we have problems we go and talk to somebody and they just tell us what we told them and they say it back to us and we reflect on it and um Mm. Mm hmm you know and it does us good so um that Mm. and that's the value of the the whole dialectic the whole Yes. reputational thing it's kind of like you you speak to other people so they can give you different angles that Yeah. you can correct and then after a while you can kind of like do that to yourself It's Yes. um, you don't yeah you it, it, externalism it, it goes through the epistemology and through the ethics and um, through the theory of mind and, and everything is that you're kind of like we're we're linked Yeah, so language is we're a linked form of, into everything else. yeah, and language is action, and through it we interact with other people. And you're right, like, I guess there's a sense in which the familiar, we lose the kind of specialness of it because it's familiar. But, but yeah, when we talk to people, because our theme, for example, in the Brisbane Stoics this year is getting together as a community and having these conversations to to teach one another, to cause one another to reflect. And That's one of the great things about the Zenonian page, the living stoicism. And it's a great thing about just making new friends. Like we've never spoken before and this is a really No, great conversation. no, it So, seems like we've known each other for years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, I guess we should wrap it up there because otherwise we would go on forever. But, but yeah, it's a never ending conversation too. Like it is a conversation that where people can keep revisiting and it's a meaningful conversation. So thank you Yeah, for I know. that, James. It's a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Yeah. All right, my friend. Well, I'll catch you on the Living Stoicism site sometime. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yeah, and you, and you. Lovely talking to you. Yeah, you too, James. Bye. See ya. Bye.